Okay, and I'd like to welcome you to number 90 of our Let's Talk About session. So we are approaching our centenary, or number 100 anyway. But um, and many of you um, will know, but the Circle of Wine Writers, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome. And for those joining the first time, um, the Circle was founded in the UK in 1960, and today we have over 250 members worldwide, 50% uh, in the UK. We've got a 50-50 balance UK and then the rest of the world, which is a lot different from what it was a few years ago. Um, we welcome members who are including wine writers, broadcasters, educators, and other professional wine communicators, and also spirits. And you'll find more about us on the website. Um, please contact me if you've got uh, any questions, but uh, for now, I'd just like to hand over to Winnie Bowman, our chairman, who will introduce our speakers today. Thank you. Over to you, Winnie. Thanks, Andrea. And well, welcome to, from me as well to everybody. And today is actually a very special um, uh, sort of introduction for me because Kathy and, and, and Gary are both my friends and uh, I drink a lot of their wine more than they think. So <laughs> and I, I miss them when they're not in Cape Town. So uh, they didn't, uh, they weren't born in wine. Uh, Gary is a geologist um, by original training and Kathy a bit more exciting. Um, <laughs> Kathy studied um, e economics and industrial psychology. And then they both got bitten by the bug and they went to UC Davis to study enology and they did some, oh, Neil, you would know, they, they did some internships at uh, the Iron Horse Winery in Sonoma, came back to Cape Town and did some wine education courses. Um, and I must say, Kathy uh, took the, the top student spot. So um, Gary's got some catching up to do. <laughs> but in the in the meantime, <laughs> Gary uh, is a a, a, a well-known judge and a lecturer in Cape Town, and also he's the past chairman of the Cape Wine Makers Guild, which of course is one of the premier organisations for top winemakers in in our country. Um, and together they started this winery in Stellenbosch, uh, which for you people who have not been there, it's well worth a visit. Hi, Angela. So you've got a bit more South Africans here tonight. Um, I just want to say for Angela and myself, it's actually supper time. So if you see us eating, if you see us eating and drinking, then uh, please forgive us. <laughs> um, or if, if we did put our picture up. Um, but what I really wanted to 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 talk about Kathy um, and Gary about is is the generosity that they they show the wine industry in South Africa. I mean, for for twelve years, they've run a winter charity drive where people drop off clothes. They've collected over eighty tons of clothes that have either been distributed or sold uh, for charities, um, shelters, and some of the money has gone to um, animal welfare uh, charities. Uh, dog food, they collect dog food. Um, so it's not only about the wine for them. And during COVID, again, they had the initiative to, to have a um, restaurant drive where they they raised over 7.8 million rand when the rand was still a rand um, to help uh, restaurants and restaurant workers all around our country. And of course, a lot of that money was also donated to um, feeding schemes, um, rape, a rape crisis center, and of course, um, dogs and the Pebbles uh, project, which is uh, enriching the lives of, the, of, of our disadvantaged children in the Western Cape. So when you go to Jordan today, you will not only find a wonderful winery, but you'll find a wonderful restaurant, lovely accommodation. And for those of you in the UK, um, they are also heavily involved because when you go to the restaurant, the biggest uh, bunch of the wines on the menu at High Timber um, on the river, which is run by Nalene, also South African, at Jordan wines, as well as um, Cape Winemaker Guild wines. The winemaker hasn't joined us yet because he's fixing something in the cellar. But Jacques, who you'll meet just now, um, a very, very talented 
young man. He's been at Jordan for, for 20 years, so he's not really so young, but in my eyes, he's still very young. Um, he was very he young when he joined us. <laughs> he what? He, he was, was very, very young, young when he joined us, yeah. Yeah, and he's he um grew up on a wine farm and got bitten by the bug and he, he's just been a joy and makes unbelievable wines. So today we're going to be hearing about Stellenbosch and um Mouse Hall, which is in the UK, and I just want to say I'm um, maybe stealing a touch of the thunder of of of, of Gary about. The, they were the first people to plant a Certico in South Africa. And I remember distinctly when the wines were launched or the project was launched in South Africa, the biggest picture that Gary had on the on this on the on the slideshow was Kathy sitting inside uh, a Certico vineyard um in Santorini, which is of course one of their favorite places to visit. So over to you guys and thank you very much for joining us and making the time to speak to us. Thanks, thanks, Winnie. Thanks, everyone. Um, really great to uh, to join you from Mouse Hall today. Um, we just flew in on Sunday from South Africa, um, and uh, Jacques Jacques is with us as well. But uh, the filtration, final filtration of the wine that we're going to be bottling uh, the next uh, couple of days, um, that's still taking place, and probably will for another half an hour or so. Really great to see everyone. Uh, Angela, who's kind of been and seen part of the project. Stephen Skelton, who uh, has been out to Mouse Hall a few times and uh, and really some great insight there as well. So really good to see uh, everyone here. Good, well, let's start off with um, kind of where we've come from and uh, give you a little bit of background. We've got uh, quite a few slides that we put together, um, show you through that, and then kind of show you to what we're doing and some of the sustainability efforts we're doing as well. Plus, uh, when he alluded to uh, Assertico, so why Assertico and why um, why are we starting this project in the UK? So uh, anyway, let's uh, let's share a screen and we'll um, and we'll chat a bit more. Right, so we start off in uh, in Stellenbosch, um, and this is kind of looking from uh, one of our Chardonnay vineyards in Stellenbosch, literally directly down into between the Hildeberg on the right hand side and Stellenbosch on the left. Uh, so let's take this sort of trip around uh, Jordan Estate. Sorry, it's frozen for some reason. There oh, we there, go. Okay, okay. Just go back. Okay. Yeah, okay, got it. Right. So as you come into uh, as you come into Cape Town, uh, this is literally the sort of trip I do monthly, uh, coming into uh, to land at Cape Town, come out over Robben Island. And when you look at the geology of uh, of Robben Island and the geology of uh, Table Mountain in the background, it's kind of all you need to know about uh, the Western Cape in a way. Because here you're looking at these um, 800 million year old um, shales and in the background, um, as we come up a little closer on the next slide, you'll see there's sort of granite right at the bottom of Table Mountain um, and, uh, and then you get the Table Mountain sandstones all on top of that. So this gives you a really good idea um, kind of what the Cape Winelands is about and we're going to get into a little more focus once we... Uh, Kind of go around the peninsula and see Jordan Estate. But the interesting thing is the very top of Table Mountain, we get the last remnants of the last ice age that came through over Africa. Uh, the Pakkeis Formation, as you go towards, and this lovely walk uh, from the Table Mountain uh, cable car uh, along to um, where Jan Smuts used to have his favorite place at the, at the, uh, at the sort of end of the mountain. Um, and just that little piece there, all these striated pebbles. Uh, which have dropped out of the glaciers. So, really interesting, uh, interesting part of uh, of the sort of Cape Winelands geology. So, Table Mountain would be in the background. You're coming around Cape Point, uh, still showing you all the Table Mountain sandstone. Uh, Jordan Estate is a kind of just off screen, very right hand side of the bay, but we can see Cape Point from many of our vineyards as well as uh, as well as Table Bay at the same time. So I did a little zoom of this just to uh, to kind of give you an idea about the Western Cape and why it is like it is before we come onto the specifics of Jordan. 
So Jordan Estate is at about the S of Stellenbosch that you can see there. Uh, you're looking directly from there to False Bay, to Table Bay, uh, and you can see uh, Robben Island, um, that sort of little blip off the edge of Cape Town. But the significance of this is, is quite profound because look at those sort of L-shaped rows of mountains there. So while our geology uh, and our rocks were formed already 600 million years ago, about 300 million years after that, you start to get the earth pushing and pulling apart. India then left and uh, moved up and started to form the Himalayas. Australia moved to the right and thought they could play rugby, but uh, we've, we've shown them a few things since then. Uh, South America kind of moved off to the left and is most of these continents, as you know, are still moving. But um, uh, kind of where those mountains are, that's shielded um, much of the Western Cape winemans um, between the coast, the sea, and the mountains. You get unique species of plants and of little animals and creatures, um, as you'll see on the next slide. And in fact, there's actually more plant species in, in Table Mountain alone than the whole of the, of the British Isles. So it's very rich because of this uniqueness of its, this, the, the ocean and the, and the mountains. So this kind of shows what uh, how Stellenbosch was formed. Um, what looks like two big molars, uh, those, those are actually granite plutons deep within the earth, uh, cooled really slowly, which is why you'll see some of the slides later on. Our granite is quite coarse porphyritic granite, uh, quite similar to um, what you might have in parts of Cornwall where they found a lot of tin as well. Uh, but this is where the uh, granite plutons formed deep within the earth. And then with the upliftment and the, um, and the pushing and pulling of the plates, you get these um, folded mountain ranges um, and then eroded from that. And then you start getting the uh, granite that we have all over between uh, Constantia, Paul, and Stellenbosch all starting to be exposed. This kind of shows you the, the granite that we have at Jordan. This is coarse porphyritic granite. Uh, the left-hand side, as you can see, is very coarse. The right-hand side is quite fine. And there's a 30 million year difference between these, even though that they're connected. So the one on the left, those uh, white crystals are all feldspar and breaks down to clay. And they can be around sort of between one and four centimeter in size. So quite large feldspar crystals. And when you look at the sort of dryness that we get in the summer, um, uh, summer during summer uh, in the growing season of the Western Cape, it's due to um, the breakdown of these feldspars and some of the biotite mica that really helps with uh, the roots being able to go deep in and, and uh, retaining moisture, drawing this out of the uh, uh, out of the clays which form deep within the earth. But on the right hand side, you can see 30 million years after our first granite was formed, you get another upwelling of granite and cool really quickly, which is why those crystals are so small. But analytically in a lab, those two rocks are identical, but you can see they're completely different. Um, so what we've done at Jordan Estate is uh, knowing I was a geologist in my previous life and spent a lot of time digging up uh, with an excavator doing test holes all over Jordan Estate. And, um, and where we get the break in two different granite types, we've now put our roads where the, where the break is so that the left-hand side will be harvested completely separately from the right. And there could be a two to three week difference in ripening between those two different um, uh, granite types. And it's particularly important for red varieties. So on the right, the, the finer granite we usually have on the, the soils are for our Cabernet Sauvignon. And because obviously once everything is black, the grapes are black, you couldn't tell if one was two weeks younger or, or less ripe than the, the other. So it's very important, particularly for reds, to get full phenolic ripeness. I mean, a lot of what we do during harvest is break up the berries and look at the seeds to make sure that we've got phenolic ripeness. But you can't do that to every berry. And where you're going to have uh, this break and change in the granite, um, it's, it's a much safer bet to be able to have one soil type, one granite um, basal structure uh, separate as a vineyard to the, to the one on the right. Okay, this slide is just to kind of show you um, sort of heat summation units and basically uh, the closer you are to the coast, the cooler it is. 
Don't think that all those uh, very dark blue, which is the coldest, uh, are the best places to plant vines. Some of those are the peaks of the mountains uh, in the Western Cape. So not, not all of them available to, uh, to plant. But in by and large, what you're looking at is coastal regions being cooler um, and the Cape being surprisingly cool uh, for its latitude because of the two oceans. So as Kathy was mentioning, all these different species of plants, this is taken looking back at one of our cereal vineyards on the west side of the property. But what we've done, and many other winemakers have done the same at the Cape, um, there are now more hectares on most farms in South Africa that are conserved and, and literally for uh, the fame boss and for animals that can, can um, roam between them. So we all plant these corridors of different rainbow species or encourage the natural uh, vegetation and just take out the, um, the aliens such as pines and, uh, and um, black wattle and Port Jackson um, that was brought in from Australia into the game. And particularly like um, species such as Renostobos, which are very scarce, one really preserves that and encourages that in these corridors. So the animals can actually travel between the farms quite freely and you've got this natural fame horse. Yeah, we've got three three different species of buck, lots of caracal. Um, some farms would have baboons, which can cause a problem in vineyards during uh, close to the growing season. Uh, we've we've uh, had a number of uh, between um, sort of Cape Hunklet and, uh, and the Stellenbosch Mountains, the 12 different leopards uh, that have been recorded and observed in, on, uh, on cameras. So it's important that we have all these corridors between our vines. We also have a breeding pair of Cape Fox, which is the only true fox in Africa. And they return year after year and have their den on the farm as well. And of course, uh, it's given rise to one of our um, early um, brands, the Chameleon. Uh, this is the Cape Dwarf Chameleon. We find hundreds of them at uh, Jordan Estate. And it's been part of a study. Uh, we have a bursary as well that we uh, pay for the um, tertiary and right up to um, a doctorate uh, for students wanting to study Cape Dwarf Chameleons. So a percentage of, uh, of what uh, you know, goes into the chameleon in, in terms of uh, revenue will go into funding uh, one or two students, um, which is done through SANBI, South African National uh, Biodiversity Institute. That's just to give you an idea of some chameleon range. So our chameleon range, if you look at the, the design on it, each flower is something that's indigenous on the property, representing what one or you know one of the wines. Okay, so we're gonna um this is just part of a 360 degree photograph taken from the top of the farm. This is south facing, so we now we're now looking towards the very edge of false bay on the left hand side. Uh, unfortunately, cut off, so it's not 360 degrees that we're going to see. But we'll but see it in pieces. 12 minutes away from the estate on the left uh, is Stellenbosch, and then you're looking, the first mountain that you see there is the Helderberg. Um, and in the background, you're looking at uh, uh, False Bay and Somerset West kind of creeping closer. So this is this is photographs taken from our coolest slope, where we planted the white varieties. Kind of almost center of that uh, is Rainica. Um, they, they are good neighbors of ours. Um, we bought a, a neighboring property, so that takes us to, I think, our 13 or 14 neighbors um, all around uh, Jordan Estate. Yeah, so looking a little further on, I can see the Turin in the background. Uh, and this is looking at the north, northern slopes of Jordan Estate. Uh, this is just before we planted the Assertico, so where you see the big green, build, green roof buildings uh, in the foreground or in, in the center, that's where the winery is. And our house is about uh, 70 meters from there, as well as the uh, restaurant and the sort of boutique hotels there now as well. And above that, where you see the sort of patchy green, that is where we've planted the Assertico. Yeah. So it was the only part that we um, didn't own until recently. Um, and that now that now was is all part of Jordan Estate. Good. So we're now we're now looking at uh, more of the east facing slopes. Um, this is looking directly far in the distance, you see Cape Point. Uh, and so very much of an influence of uh, 
uh, of False Bay. Um, but those east-facing vineyards sort of protected from the battering winds coming off uh, False Bay. Uh, but you can see the sort of white color that's a young, uh, young vineyard in the foreground there, but the white color, and we'll come on to detail on that when we go specifically drill down into um, different vineyards. And that's all white quartz um, associated with the granite. So what's quite um, special about the property is being having the two oceans and the breezes from the two oceans, where the photographs taken is some of our Sauvignon vineyards. And even in summer, at the height of summer, if you go up into these vineyards, it's always chilly, especially in the evening, you need a, a sweater. And um, what's good about that is you'll have warm, dry days, but overnight it cools. So in the morning, your grapes are cool again when you're ready for harvesting. So it's a very, um, it firstly extends the ripening process as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, and this is taken from where our, um, we have a wine called the Outlier. Um, and it really is an outlier because it's a barrel fermented Sauvignon Blanc. So more of that uh, sort of real black currant leaf um, reminds one of, of really great um, sort of Bordeaux Sauvignon Blanc. And that's now looking uh, east towards, that's Constantia, the dip on the uh, sort of center there, and then obviously the flat part of Table Mountain, uh, and then the right towards uh, Cape Town. You can even see the, um, the airport runway in the, uh, in the sort of middle of the slide. Um, and in fact, when you land at Cape Town Airport and the southeast is blowing, look left. And the very first vineyards you'll see from the estate That'll be Jordan Estate. It'll be our west-facing village, where we do our Cobblers Hill and, um, and our Syrah. Okay, so we'll go on to just a few of the wines, and then and then we kind of drill down into why Assertico, and and then also compare that to what we're doing in the UK. So um, right at the very top of the farm, where we grow our Sauvignon Blanc. Um, We've uh, sorted out which vineyards we, we think are best for our particular style of Sauvignon Blanc. Called it cold fact, not just because of the next slide, um, but Rodriguez, uh, who had this um, uh, album that he brought out when we were all students at university, kind of many ways we use these as protest song songs, but um, uh, he was unknown to him became incredibly famous, sold uh, millions and millions of, uh, of albums. And um, Cold Fact was, uh, was the sort of signature album of his, but it was a play on that, uh, which we play in the, in the cellar right through harvest, as well as uh, the fact that we do this cold soaking uh, overnight on the skins for the Sauvignon Blanc. And cold fermentation. In fact, here at Mouse Hall about a year back, I got a call from his daughter uh, who said he's well, at that stage, we're still in good health, late, compliant, um, and uh, he has, in fact, now since passed away. Okay, so drilling down into, into granite. Um, this is 600 million year old granite, uh, quite different to granites around uh, the rest of the world, apart from I've seen some fairly similar granites um, uh, around Cornwall as well, because the mineralization is pretty similar. And in the 1800s, they brought out Cornish tin miners uh, to, to work some of these adits and shafts uh, in, the, in the hillsides here, in the, both the Bottlera Hills and parts of Stellenbosch. When we go back to the, uh, this particular rock again, um, yeah, just to show you the difference in the, in the granites. Right, so we'll come on to a little lower down on our south facing side, uh, where we do Shannon, we, we've got Shannon Blanc. And the Shannon that we've got there um, is now over around 40 years old. My dad replanted um, a vineyard of Shannon that was there before. We've named our, um, our barrel fermented Shannon after in Louis Albert Perengay. He was the guy who saved South Africa from Biloxera. Uh, but this, what sort of is unknown is that uh, South Africa got phylloxera 30 years after Europe. So there was a lot of time available um, while research was taking place in, in Europe uh, as vineyards were getting wiped out. So by the time that he discovered phylloxera, and here's a good general knowledge question, 
the Luxor has discovered about where Grutuskia Hospital is in Cape Town. Mowbray. Yeah, just around Mowbray and close to, uh, close to the uh, river um, was the first Veloxera farm. But Louis Albert Perengay brought out all these rootstocks. Um, and funny enough, at that stage, 98% of the industry was actually planted to semi -op. So he brought out not only rootstocks, but also to lots of signs of different um, grape varieties. So when the Cape started to be replanted, um, and he was quite a feared man, because if he found phylloxera in a vineyard, the whole thing was grubbed up, and uh, you had to start again. But they knew what the problem was. But uh, at that stage, and you'll see from the next, from the next slide, so this is looking towards that vineyard, just close to where the middle, uh, that middle reservoir is. To the right uh, of that. The right, yeah. right hand side of that um, is where the Shannon is. And the previous photograph that uh, we've shown with those three all uh, put together, that's taken up in the mist on the left hand side, looking basically uh, uh, sort of south, south side. So you can see how cool it can be in the afternoons and evenings on the farm. So this is kind of what we commonly find even, um, you know, every every time I'm taking vineyard samples, I usually find one or two of these um, ancient hand axes. And what Louis Albert Perengay found is that um, uh, on his sort of forays through Stellenbosch, and there were a couple of sites um, where there were very obviously um, uh, been a settlement before, and he reckoned that this is early Stone Age, so had dated them to about 500,000 years uh, ago. And these uh, hand axes was quite amazing. We find quite a few round rocks as well, um, you know, like that, a little bit like a donut with a hollow through the middle. They use them as weights of digging sticks, but also a lot of hand axes. We find left-hand ones as well as right-handed ones. Uh, Kathy's left-handed, so that's how I knew. Um, because I gave her this perfect hand axe. One day and I said, I've just found this, but it doesn't fit my hand at all. And she said, let me see him. It fitted perfectly. But anyway, until about 1950, uh, early Stone Age was called um, Stellenbosch Man, early man. And then, of course, around the world, and particularly in, in Africa, they found a number of different sites dating between 500 and a million years. And uh, then called it a cumin. So we still find these today. If you're walking through the Shannon Vineyard doing so, so, um, grape sampling, you'll see one sticking, partially sticking up, and it's just come to the surface. Good. So we now move from the south. Those, those first few lines were from the south side of the property. And Jordan is the only estate in Stellenbosch with north facing, south, east, and west facing. Um, and here, this is now all our Chardonnays on the uh, east side of the property. So we do an unoaked Chardonnay, which is the one on the left-hand side of your screen. The middle one is barrel fermented around nine months. And then we do uh, a wine that Richard Branson named the whole nine yards. And we really go the whole nine yards to make it. It's a single vineyard site. So we didn't produce all three of these Chardonnays right from our first vintage in 93. We produced the middle one, which is our classic barrel fermented style, French, French barrique for about nine months in barrel. And then um, from 2003, we started to produce the Anouk Chardonnay and 2002 with the nine yards. So these sort of developed as we, obviously we got to know our vineyards very well from the first planting in, in 1980, um, 1982. We got to know the vineyards, but um, as they developed and as they improved and we could watch the fermentation through, we kept every um, barrel lot separate so we could taste out each vineyard and understand it better. We started to identify which were the best Chardonnay vineyards for which of these wines. Good. And of course, all our Chardonnay, as you saw from the uh, photograph taken from far away, is all situated on this white course. And it's what happens within the granite that makes things so interesting. So white quartz all over. Uh, in fact, it's so bright early in the morning, you need um, sunglasses as the light shines on the quartz back underneath the bunches again. So really high light reflection. But because of its uh, height above sea level, it's already cool. 
And because it's uh, east facing, um, you lose that light in the sort of uh, early mid afternoon, and then the, the vineyard gets quite cool again. So you don't have that late afternoon sun. Chardonnay is all barrel fermented. This is down. Uh, so we have three different tiers in our cellar. Uh, above the ceiling that you can see there with the light reflecting up on it, we have our um, sort of tank, uh, tank storage area. And above that would be where the um, uh, where the grapes are crushed and our red wine is produced. So it's very much of a gravity flow concept. Um, we do a bit of a James Bond method to, to make the wine, you know, shaken, not stirred. Rather than the traditional uh, French batonage of opening up the, the, the bung and whisking up the yeast leaves, we roll the barrels once a week. Um, does the same thing, but in a less oxidated way. And we, we always have no sulfur on our wines, no sulfites at all on the Chardonnay until just prior to bottling. And so you always end up with much lower sulfurs than what um, uh, you know many others would have in the industry. And on the on the cellar design, as Winnie had said, we um we had different degrees. We went over to California and studied um, wine making at UC Davis. And while we were there for we were there for about two years, we um used to visit all the wineries and see what worked and and how it if it if it, you know because obviously we were planning for our own cellar. And so a lot of the ideas that you see here, you would have seen in in California from the eighties. And ideas, we wanted something that was very functional, that just Gary and I could work on our own in without needing a lot of staff to be. So we needed the gravity flow. Um, we have these fantastic overhead retort tape um, shaped um, stainless steel tanks where we do all our red fermentations. But all our whites, such as the um, Shannon and the Chardonnay, will come down into the underground cellar where they can ferment in small French brie. That gives you an idea of, uh, we do all our Chardonnays uh, uh, barrel fermented, both the nine yards and the barrel fermented Chardonnay. And both of them have won uh, independently of one, and one year they went against each other um, for IWSC trophies or decanter trophies. Uh, but this is this just shows in the yeast leaves in the barrel. But we like to have a few of the barrels with um, perspex ends of it, just so that we can see how the fermentation is is going and, and how the yeast leaves are settling. And also over the years, we've obviously fine-tuned the barrels we really like to work with, the cooperages that we get from France, um, you know, the, the, the different cooperages. And we usually have one of the coopers would come out, visit us, taste with us. And so we really make fine-tuning our selection of barrels that we use for the Chardonnay. So this just shows you the... Uh, um, the sort of underground cellars, um, and then also the use of amphora. So it was uh, it was quite amazing when we started to plant a, a, a certico. I said to the team, "Look, um, we're going to make a certico, but we're going to do it in stainless steel and clay amphora, not barrels." Um, and Angel has been part of a few tastings, I think, that we've had where um, uh, we were looking at at different styles of a certico and. I certainly preferred uh, more the cleaner um, style, more that sort of minerally style rather than emphasize. Expressing oak. the fruit yeah. more than the oak, yeah. Rather than oak on a certico. You can do that with Chardonnay, I think, much better. And um, I said, look, we're going to buy um, Amphora and uh, use that for the certico. And of course, the team ganged up on me and they said, uh, we're going to buy them now the same year you're going to plant the mines. So that by the time, uh, we we making a certico. We know how to use them, and so we've uh, we've developed uh, another range of wines, all from these uh, old vine series vines, uh, Shannon and and Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, that's all fermented in uh, in amphora. This just shows you looking down directly towards Stellenbosch in the background. Uh, Chardonnay is Chardonnay is being collected and being harvested there. And then something that's quite an anomaly, um, you don't often see this, uh, but we have one small vineyard. And in fact, the I think the, the total number of cases of Riesling produced in South Africa, if I'm correct, is somewhere around 20,000. Uh, but 12, it's not a lot. Um, and in the old days, um, we had to call it Rhine Riesling. Um, 
but obviously we're not on the Rhine, so there was no way you could export any any Riesling, but we had wonderful old Riesling buyers. And it's the only variety at Jordan where we buy some grapes in because we don't have enough Riesling. We only have a few hectares of it. And so from Hill and Arda Valley, and also from Elgin, we were um, working the vineyards, but buying in those grapes. And uh, it was really only that first year that we started to buy grapes that we um, harvested first at Elgin and then in Himmel and Arda Valley, and then lastly at Jordan, and made us realize how cool our vineyards were. And we went back into the vineyards, not just because we had understood now how, how much cooler we were than the rest of Stellenbosch, but also changed our red wine making practices, um, particularly viticulturally. We opened up the canopies a lot more um, because our cabs were a little leaner and greener, I suppose, than what uh, they are nowadays. And this shows you the uh, the type of soil that grows on. You can even find little, little fossils and brachiopods and trilobites uh, in these shales uh, that the Riesling is on. And looking directly now to, uh, uh, this is one of our um, top Chardonnay vineyards, um, looking at that at the sort of curved rows that we have with um, uh, the Siemensberg in the background. Yeah, so coming on to, um, now we start with, uh, with the first of the red wines. So um, the Black Magic Merlot has kind of developed as a single vineyard site, but from a particular uh, part of the, of the farm. East facing where there's a little bit more clay. And you look at the next slide. So associated with the granites, you get a lot of uh, both tin and tourmaline. Um, and these are all coarse porphyritic granites. And if you see the, uh, um, the vineyard when you walk through there, the soils are actually really dark, quite black. Uh, you wouldn't want to grow any Sauvignon Blanc, Chen, or Chenin, or Chardonnay there, because uh, it, the, the vineyard just gets too warm. Um, and I was walking through there with a group of geologists one day, and the guy said to me, "Do you realize the significance of the uh, of these rocks that we have around here? Are we picking up a few of these tourmaline crystals?" And I said to the guy, "Yeah, you know, I know it's uh, black tourmaline," and he said, "No, but." In, uh, in Europe, all the ancient philosophers um, would use tourmaline, um, you know, when they cast their spells. And in fact, uh, a, another geologist who was from Limpopo said, um, you know, he, uh, from his village, uh, the local Sangoma is also doing exactly the same thing. So it became the uh, Black Magic Merlot, um, launched at New York, with some interesting, uh, uh, interesting observations. Customers actually had black tourmaline on their on their shelves. So that's the view, that's the view from the east, looking east um, from the um, Merlot vineyard. Yeah, looking directly so, at at the Siemensberg in the back. Effectively, we almost four farms in one. Obviously, Stellenbosch is known for being um, red wine production predominantly, but we're very lucky to have both this east facing and the south facing slopes. So we come onto the cab and we see the next, uh, it's called the long fuse. Uh, for those who know me well now, I have quite a short fuse sometimes, um, but uh, you see the next slide. Um, even though I was a geologist and I had uh, done all these test holes, random test holes uh, showing no problems with the soil, we needed to add up to 30 tons per hectare of lime. But what I didn't know is between my random test holes, we had all these, uh, massive granite boulders. So we ended up having to stop plowing operations on this one particular vineyard, uh, opened up with an excavator. Uh, we drilled uh, a series of, uh, of holes and I convinced the contractor, you know, dynamite is cheap in South Africa, but convinced the guy that we could uh, time this so that we, we, we sent the rock uphill rather than down. And as you see from this, uh, from this slide, um, he wired it all wrong. And I was given the sort of uh, the moment of pushing down the plunger. And of course, here you can see the rock going downhill. And uh, it was uh, a near disaster because we, we broke the sort of uh, main controlling valve of all the irrigation there. And we had bits of rocks on the roof of the winery and on our house that 
uh, we managed to clear the rock and we put them all uh, in the roads where we get these two breaks in the different granites. And that's now become the site of our Sophia video that we do for the Cape Winemakers Guild. Okay, so now we're moving right over the edge of the property. This is now west facing. This is the prospector where we're growing Syrah. So we really like um, the Mulroan style or the Skarig style um, of Syrah. Can you see the next slide? So this is all on highly mineralized uh, tin, and that's both pool's gold, so it contains both iron as well as tin. tin so there's about 30% tin here. So once again, you can see when that breaks down, the, the richness of the soil is ideal for varieties like Syrah. Yeah, so you get these deep red clay loam soils. That's looking at the directly the Syrah vineyards. So the waste phase. So you can see it's one of the closest vineyards to Cape Town. And it's a much warmer side than the original side of Jordan Estate. This 50 hectare piece uh, we bought um, more recently uh, after my parents had, uh, had sort of uh, handed over the farm to us. And uh, this little uh, pond that you see in the front, um, just below where all these uh, pin cushions are, that was built in the 1800s as a, uh, as a dam to be able to wash out all the tin from these uh, granites. Looking at some of the mine shafts, uh, these are uh, adits that go quite deep into the hillside. Um, uh, and all that they were doing was getting the, uh, the tin all out. So associated with that, uh, we have a single vineyard site called Cobbler's Hill. Uh, my great grandfather came out from close to Leicester. Um, and of course, most of the family had studied at Northampton Tech, where all good shoemakers come from. So it uh, was passed on from father to son over generations. And by the time I came around, so the third or fourth generation later, I had rocks in my head, became a geologist, fell in love with wine, and uh, the rest is history. So luckily I didn't go into the shoe business. But my dad had always said that the bouquet of old wines is much nicer than that of old shoes. So I suppose he, uh, uh, he was able to drink the, um, uh, you know, the produce afterwards. So we made this Bordeaux style blend from this west facing slope, spends about two years in barrel, the first as a varietal, and then the second year as a blend, but made it in honor of Gary's great grandfather and their shoe, the shoe business. That's Gary's great grandfather. And then from the Riesling vineyard as well, we produce a sweeter one. So any any botrytis infected bunches we leave for another month or so, as the weather cools and those those mist clouds come over, we we end up with Mello, with our Melofera, which is our noble late wine, which is we don't harvest it every year this way. Some of the drier years we couldn't harvest it, but it makes a lovely dessert, a sweet wine from Riesling. Yeah, and not too cloying. It's about ninety to ninety five grams of sugar, which means it's really great with fruit-based desserts, and, um, and, and it's a really nice cheese. And that kind of shows you the, the mists that come over. This is uh, towards the end of harvest, and so we always leave, deliberately leave uh, some of the uh, grapes. And when you've had a, a year like this, you get really uh, clean botrytis. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively easy wine to make there. Right, so why Assertico? Um, we bought the neighboring property, the last sort of 20 hectares as you come up the uh, the valley on the north facing side of the property. You can see the Assertico vineyards in the background um, and you can see the, the sea. You're looking directly at False Bay. So it's uh, 14 kilometers to the sea on that side, 24 kilometers to the Atlantic Ocean, but gets the, the breeze directly from uh, from False Bay and it's incredibly windy. There's no water there. It's all dry land farmed. Um, some of it we're doing in, in these ancient Kulura, these basket-shaped um, vines, and some we're doing uh, as, as conventional trellis vines. So quite an interesting project for us because it's quite similar in some ways to Santorini, where very good quality, fine, great salinity um, uh, certicos are made. So for us, it's a nice comparison to see how ours do on our granitic soil versus those of Santorini. So if you look at assertico.com, it points to the top of Jordan. Um, 
Kathy's uh, heritage is, is Greek, and we didn't know too much about it, or she didn't know too much about it, although her grandfather uh, passed away very young, um, but just after he came to South Africa. And um, so this is the very top of this hill, windswept, um, and as I said, very dry, uh, very highly mineralized soils, uh, broken up, sort of brecciated um, from all this movement, um, uh, between these granites, and uh, we were, we this is now the site of South Africa's very first mother block of uh, Isotico. It was initially a twenty year quarantine period to get the mines into the country, and um, then now uh, I think about three or four uh, producers who've got um, cuttings from this that are now starting to plant Isotico as well. So that's looking directly at the town of Stellenbosch in the background, um, looking through the saddle there towards Franschhoek. Um, and th this is now starting to uh, use these 30-ton uh, excavators. Uh, you're digging down about one and a half meters deep just to loosen the soil. Uh, luckily, it's no, there are no layers in here. It's just highly mineralized um, granitic soils. Planted the first uh, Asotigo in 2019. And uh, the, the growth was incredible, even though we didn't have uh, any irrigation. And I think we would really have struggled if we planted the, the vines between 2015 and 2018, uh, when we had that very dry spell in the, in the Western Cape. But luckily, 2019, the, um, the drought was broken. And um, we try and use a lot of organic mulches um, to, uh, you'll see on this next slide, a lot of organic mulches to uh, to conserve water and because it's all dry land um, we go through a lot of straw and we're starting to use that more and more both to suppress weeds uh, and also because of of what our regenerative farming practices in the UK have taught us about what we can do in South Africa it's a lot easier in the UK I can tell you uh, just because the uh, moisture levels are higher um, and nobody steals your sheep but uh, it's uh, it's a bit more challenging in South Africa, but uh, by using straw, we can get away with it. But even we had a visitor from one of the winemakers from Santorini came to visit, and he was amazed at how good the growth was and how healthy the vines were looking from a young age. Yeah, so this is uh, when he mentioned, uh, Kathy hates me putting this photograph, so I, I did. Uh, but this was Kathy aged, uh, I think she just turned 18. And uh, this is in one of these ancient Kalura when we were on Santorini. She hates me putting in the photograph because you'll see on the next one, this is taken 2019, same vine. And all that happened was the vine got older. Uh, but Kathy weighs 15 kilograms less now than when she was a student in France. And uh, I, love, I love putting this photograph in. <laughs> anyway, getting on to... Uh, what you've seen on many of our South African wine seals, you've got to be, uh, there's all sorts of checks and every bottle is numbered. You can trace that back uh, down to the vineyard, uh, even in our case, who harvested it and uh, what you've done right through the cellar. But uh, you'll see on the next slide. So in in uh, in planting a Certico, it's kind of led us to um, right first and foremost being part of this old mine project. And you've tasted, I'm sure, many vines coming from uh, or part of the old mine project. Um, some, some incredible um, heritage vineyards are coming out of that. But we now have five um, single sites dedicated to the old mine project and all uh, fermented in Amphora. Timepiece uh, is the name that we've given to it. And here you see on the right-hand side, uh, my dad on the right-hand side. This was taken during the last harvest. Alex, our son, is on the uh, left-hand side. Um, and uh, he's the sort of current generation. Uh, he's created a new position for himself. He's um, called himself a project manager, so he doesn't step on anybody's toes. And uh, everybody's still, uh, you know, at working at Jordan. I'm the oldest Toppy around there, the oldest uh, person, but it's, um, I think when you look at the timepiece that's written in my dad's handwriting, uh, it's a wonderful wine, but made in limited quantities. 
You just see some of the packaging. And from Internet Hub Forum. Oh, this is interesting. So what 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 does the what does the part of the old vine project tell us? And um, it's really kind of looking at old vines and working out what was what makes them so successful. What can we learn today when we plant new vineyards to try and get them to age as long as what they have uh, in in the past? And you know the vines have to be a minimum 35 years old. There are a few in South Africa that are 100 plus, uh, but not many. But the other day, as part of the Cape Winemakers Guild, we have a monthly tasting. And this was one of my favorites of all the Constantia wines. We tried wines from 1821, <laughs> 1855, 1880, and of course, 1791. And this is what it looked like. Uh, this is the 1791 Constantia. Absolutely fantastic wine. Uh, we've tasted them uh, before in uh, uh, in California when I was working in Professor O's lab, uh, but this was the opportunity of tasting a, a whole lot of um, different um, vintages. Um, and, but you uh, look at the colour, yeah. I mean, even to the rim, it's really quite incredible. Uh, there's Charlie the dog. Yeah, so that, that's what the uh, label looks like, 1791. Anyway, so last last of the wines is the uh, Sophia. And um, this is made as a single site. You can see where we blew up some of the rocks, um, but it's a Cab Molo Cabernet Franc uh, blend. We do a Sophia for the Cape Winemakers Guild auction, and it's now 21 years been on the auction as one of the top wines. That's kind of what Jordan was like in the 1920s. And you see the next slide, what it looks like today. Next slide. Kind of, it's evolved from there. We now have uh, two restaurants in the estate, Cellar Door, as well as uh, the second restaurant with Martinez Ferreira. Um, we did a whole empowerment deal with many of our staff um, uh, since uh, 2013, I think we started the project. Um, and I'd always promised them that uh, when they retired, we'll buy them houses off the estate uh, give them the title deeds, and then they've had something they've always worked for all their life, a bit like a, a sort of pension fund. Um, but in South Africa, it's it's a pecu peculiarity. Unlike the UK, you cannot split farms. Uh, even if there are multiple houses on there, you can't take a piece of land and split it uh, and give somebody or sell them um, a piece of land. It's just absolutely impossible. You can only do that in... Uh, um, uh, in this in the sort of township area. So all our staff um, uh, ended up uh, with their own houses. They all still uh, um, now head of various divisions at Jordan Estate, and we turned the whole complex into a boutique hotel. So many of their grandkids or nephews or nieces would be working uh, now in the uh, at the luxury suites and would welcome you and say, this is where my grandparents or where my uncle or aunt used to live. So kind of the foray into uh, restaurants kind of happened twice in the same year. Um, 2009, we opened two restaurants, the Jordan Restaurant, as well as High Timber Restaurant in London. Not sure how many of you have been to High Timber, but as Winnie said, great place to be able to taste not only Cape Winemakers Guild wines, but many winemakers from around the world would come and launch wines there. Uh, so if you want to... Uh, you know, have uh, first growth uh, vintages, you want to go and pray, taste Amand Rousseau, um, multiple vintages, you can do that there. So really close to St. Paul's, <coughs> right on the river. There's still, after 14 years, the only restaurant in the square mile with seats on the Thames. One of our favorite places, this is where many business deals take place in London. This is in the red wine cellar. And Martinez Ferreira, um, our chef, is taken over from George Jardin, highly acclaimed chef in his own right, um, also in the sort of top 20 chefs in South Africa, uh, moved down from Johannesburg. We've totally rebuilt the restaurant. So for those of you who've been to Jordan Estate, um, Alex has actually used all the rocks that I that I'd blown up um, from this uh, Cabernet vineyard. We've lined this, lined the whole restaurant, um, it's now uh, completely covered where we had, it was really hot under umbrellas in the past. 
uh, but a really amazing environment and lifted the roof so you get this most incredible view down the valley and of course Martinez uh, chef has got one of the most incredible views of any chef uh, elsewhere because at high timber the chef is kind of below ground uh, here Martinez is looking at the Cape Winelands every day. Sustainability, I think, is uh, really important for us, both at uh, Mouse Hall, that we're going to come on to, as well as at Jordan. You've all heard of the disaster with uh, load shedding, a euphemism for not having power for anywhere up to 8 or 12 hours a day. Um, we've put our whole complex under solar panels, um, as well as we've got backup generators from, uh, from before. But just really to, um, to kind of... Uh, produce our energy in a little bit more of a, of a green uh, way. And we've done the same now at Mouse Hall as well. So Gary's dad, if, you, if any of you have ever met him on the farm, um, Angela knows him. Um, he always said that the Jordan family are a very lucky family. But I think often it's about what you do with your luck. And so Gary and I had obviously spent a large part of our adult lives, about 35 years at Jordan, developing it, you know, growing it, reducing the wines and an opportunity came up I mean Jordan was now very well established we have a hundred staff there a really good um, staff complement that are fantastic you know they are the reason we are successful and so the opportunity came up for us to actually um, go to the UK and we said with all the exciting things that are happening in the UK for for wines, let's see, um, you know, let's take part, of, take this opportunity and start a small retirement project there. And this is how Mouse Hall came about. Hardly a retirement project because uh, Stephen Skelton's been there, uh, I think, a couple of times and has supplied some vines to us as well. Jacques just walked in from the cellar, so I'm going to call him as well to come and join us. But we'll start seeing the next uh, the next uh, slides. So this is what greets you as you walk up. The label that you and the and the logo that you saw in the in the first slide was is the one for our gin. Just so we, we found this we found this property and um, we actually started looking in about mid 2016. We wanted something with good climate, um, so you know somewhere in the south. Um, we started as, as, as far west as Devon. We looked everywhere. We must have, must have done like over 4,000 miles looking for an ideal property. And eventually we found it only an hour from London in East Sussex. So it's a beautiful property, ancient trees, which is quite run down at the time. And so for us, once again, a challenge for us to take, see what we could do and, um, you know, bring it back to its, its earlier glory. And this is what we've been working on since the beginning of 2018. Okay. Yeah, so to introduce Jacques to you, uh, I imagine the last filtration went well. And very well. <laughs> very wet. <laughs> and five degrees is not the... Not the <laughs> Well, it's pretty, it's pretty chilly compared to uh, Stellenbosch at the moment. So, yeah. anyway, next slide. Yeah, so that's kind of Mars Hall, uh, just as we, uh, we were about to start um, doing renovations. Um, and if you look at the next slide as well, this is just when we planted them. I think Jacques was with us, helped put, uh, put all these tubes on. Uh, Remember very well. <laughs> Backbreaking back -breaking work. So that was um, 2019. But it's, but it's obviously progressed since then. Um, and we not only uh, have our own grapes, but we actually bought in a lot of grapes this last two years, particularly this year. Um, we've taken over uh, Hidden Springs Vineyard as well that we um, uh, have made wine there and have rented the whole uh, cellar as well as made wine at Mouse Hall this year. So we're getting grapes in from all over Sussex, uh, both from sort of Chichester side to uh, Battle to all around Western East Sussex. Regenerative farming is uh, something that's obviously quite important, as I mentioned earlier, easier in the UK, uh, both to understand how, um, how to proceed, as well as um, uh, because of the moisture levels and high carbon content. Our carbon content uh, on the soils in the UK are more than double what we get in uh, in South Africa. So hence uh, the earlier slides of showing you how we're using straw and so on. But 
Here in the UK, we're often using wool um, to suppress weeds between vines, and that's been quite an interesting development. So that's um, that's kind of what the uh, uh, the distillery and winery looked like. Uh, the Jacques just come out of now. Uh, that's where Kathy bought me a chainsaw for Christmas, and I bought her a brush cutter, as you do. And um, I, I took a step back because I realized nobody would believe how derelict the property was before. Nobody had lived there for quite a few years. So everything had grown. The brambles were in the trees. Everything was overgrown. So while all the buildings are medieval, that's the newest building being a 1950s asbestos clad as at Barn at the time. Um, that's Catherine, kind of... Sorry, I'm going to have to just slightly interject quickly, just to say that uh, this, we've now hit the six o'clock, so a number of our guests will have to leave, I'm afraid. Okay. So okay. I just wanted okay. to say thank you to them who are still here, but obviously you are the people that are still with us and can stay on are invited to stay on if they wish to a little bit longer. But I just wanted to say thank you who has, if you have to leave at this stage. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. So from a sustainability point of view, we can power the whole um, complex um, using solar, apart from when it snows. Um, and that's halfway through the project. Um, so inside we've done, we've done that. So we put a um, old distillation unit, a really nice 420 liter pot still, um, and surrounded, the, surrounded it with the winery. And the back is the winery with the press, yeah. So first harvest um, photographs just to share with you. Um, these are botanicals, which some of them are grown uh, locally here in, in Sussex, some at Mouse Hall. Uh, and uh, we started off by making spirits, making gin while the uh, vines were maturing. So we produce a sustainable gin. Our daughter, Christy, is the distiller and she sourced the whole packaging has all been sourced that's recyclable, con consumable, compostable, um, you know, very sustainable. And it's just, just to give you sort of images. The packaging. Yeah. We've renovated all the buildings. So finally, the scaffolding came down uh, at the main house. It's been three and a half years of building. Um, and because they all listed... Um, uh, listed buildings as well. There's an extra layer of uh, complexity, which we enjoy because, uh, you know, you don't get uh, buildings from the 11th century in South Africa. And it's been a really interesting project, uh, renovating everything. So that's our that's our mouse, um, our little mouse hall, the mouse on the oast. And for us, this is a new, exciting adventure. We just at the start of it, um, you know, producing our early young English wines, and we're very excited about the potential of this industry. So the, the wines coming up that are going to be bottled this week, um, we're, we're from Tidebrook, from the Tidebrook area. They're going to be Tidebrook labelled wines because uh, you don't want mousy wines. But obviously it's Mouse Hall Estate, um, and that's been named that uh, since the 11th century already. So interesting times, great in the UK. Um, challenging sometimes when you want to get um, uh, when you want to get uh, analyses done. Uh, it's in many ways easier for uh, Jacques, Cathy, or myself to um, hop, take samples, hop on a plane, land at Cape Town Airport, hand your samples in, and by eleven o'clock in the morning, you have a full set of analyses from VinLab. Uh, whereas in the UK. Um, it could take you 10 days before you get uh, a full set. Um, and it's a bit more difficult and challenging to make wine like that. I think this is just something of being a young industry. I mean, South Africa has obviously been making wine for many years, and I think all these things will start to, to move quite quickly, especially with the growth in plantings and the growth of production in the UK. It's really inspiring and, and very wonderful to be part of. You said about... Uh... So your answer is we bought in barrels from the Shawne, mm -hmm. um, some Pinot Noir, and a bit of rosé. Yeah, that's gonna. It's quite exciting. Um, apples are 13 percent, very similar to South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, big full body wines. It'll be difficult to tell the difference between the wines we have here and South African wines. Um, it's gonna be. It's very exciting. 
And from the 23 vintage, we'll um, begin making some sparkling, which obviously takes a long time in the bottle. Good. Great. Well, thanks for being part of our journey. Well, now I'd like to say thank you both and also Sharp for joining us this evening and uh, for presenting, you know, the Jordan Winery and also starting to introduce introducing Mousel. And I'm sure people have got some wonderful wines to look forward to there as well. Uh